Yeah, how to follow that. That was fantastic, a fantastic talk. I really, really enjoyed that. So yeah, I'm here to talk about grid layout. And this slide has a few things about me and what I do and why I'm involved with CSS and how to get hold of me. And the thing is, I've been talking about grid layout for just over four years now. I've been standing on stages and telling people about this wonderful, wonderful thing that is coming soon. And this is the very first conference where I've been able to stand on a stage and say, it's here. It landed <laughs> in all of these browsers in one month, which was, is completely unprecedented for something of this scale to get that kind of interoperability effort for all of these browser vendors to get it out, to get it into the browser, and in a very, very solid way, you know, and something that you can actually use. Um, it's been you know, quite a thing. So we're all very excited, those of us who have been looking at Grid for a while, to actually have it in people's hands and see what people are going to make with it. So Grid's a huge spec, and I can't teach you all of Grid layout in half an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and answer the kind of top questions that I get asked about it when I talk about it. So what it is, why is it different to Flexbox? How do I actually get started using Grid? And then the big one, you know, what about old browsers? What about those browsers that don't yet support Grid layout? How do we deal with those? Now, the helpful people on Twitter like to tell me that Flexbox exists when I talk about Grid layout. And there's also this kind of assumption that the CSS Working Group are creating competing specifications, some kind of CSS spec death match, you know, which will win, Flexbox or Grid. And that's not the case. They're two different specs. They share some very common features. Uh, but they're for sort of different stuff. So the obvious difference between Flexbox and Grid, and what's defined in the specification, is that Flexbox is for one-dimensional layout. That's if you want to lay something out as a row or a column. That's, that's what one dimensional means. So this is a Flexbox example. You've got a bunch of things laid out with Flexbox. You're letting them wrap. And so as they wrap onto the final line there, that bottom one will spread out if it's got all that room, because that's how space distribution works in Flexbox. It works across the individual row. Grid is two-dimensional, so rows and columns at the same time. So this is pretty much the same layout using Grid. But here, as you can see, as it reflows, the things stay in their columns. They don't spread out across the row, because we've asked it to line them up in rows and columns. And you might be thinking, well, I can get around that Flexbox issue by adding percentage widths to my flex items, by kind of breaking some of the flexibility. And that's exactly the point at which you might think, actually, I need grid layout here, not Flexbox, because I want to do this in two dimensions. And that's actually the code for that example. If I want to make that particular grid layout, I say uh, display grid. We've got some gaps with grid gap. And then we've got this slightly baffling looking statement where we say grid template columns, repeat autofill, fill as many columns as I can get in uh, with a minimum of 200 pixels and a maximum of one fraction unit, which spreads out the remaining space. But we're doing that on the container rather than the, on the items themselves. So as I mentioned, the minute you start constraining Flexbox, the minute you start stopping Flexbox being flexible, that's often the case where you need grid layout. And that's one of the reasons it's been designed. Another way to look at this is that Flexbox works from the content out. And grid works layout in. So if you've got a collection of things, and it might be different sizes, and all you want is for the space between them to be sort of worked out equally, that's a good Flexbox use case. And you get this sort of thing, where that space between ends up equal, no matter how big the items become. And perhaps you want some things to grow bigger than other things when there's free space in the container. Again, this is a good Flexbox use case. The content is really the key thing here. It's dictating the layout. Flexbox is just managing the spacing between stuff. The space distribution is happening. Now, Grid takes the other approach. It works from the container in. We say, here is my grid. It looks like this. It's got these columns. It's got these rows. Now I've got this stuff, and I just want to drop it into the grid. So we're actually defining the grid on the container, and then we're putting things into it. 
So here's a grid. I'm creating a three-column track grid using the FR unit. This is a really handy unit that's been created for grid layout, and it represents a portion of the space in the container. It's a fraction of the available space. So here we've got three that are all one fraction. So we have sort of just divide the space into three, and then we've got one, two, three, and they're all going to stay equal. And as they get bigger and smaller, they'll have the equal amount of space. And so we get something like this. We can ask some of the tracks to take up more of the space in proportion. So here I've still got three tracks, but two of them are 2FR. So the available space in that container is divided into five. And we have two parts, one part, and two parts. And as you can see, that happens right the way down the column. Because space distribution is happening on the container, it isn't happening on the individual rows. And I think one of the reasons I get asked is this sort of confusion between flex and grid is because using grid, it's a mindset shift. Almost all of our existing layout methods work on the item. So in a float grid, we float items, and then we have to add widths to those items themselves in order to lay them out on the grid and for them to take up the amount of space we want. Inline block is exactly the same. We're working on the items. We have to put a width on the items. The wrapper just provides the kind of container for those things. And even with Flexbox, although we declare Flexbox on the parent, we say display flex on a container, the minute we want to make a grid, we have to start targeting the items. Or if we want to change anything about the flexibility of the items, we have to do it with the flex properties on the item themselves. So grid is different. We do our grid creation on the parent. The only other thing that kind of works in a similar way is multiple column layout, where we lay things out in columns, and you do that on the container. We don't really have things in CSS that work from the container down. Grid is the first thing to do that. And I think that is why often people are a little bit confused about what's going on here and think, oh, no, we can just do that with Flexbox. It's working the other way around. And of course, there are extra things in the grid spec. It's not just a different way of doing layout. We, you can layer items. You can have two items occupying the same space. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, you've got full control of negative space. If you want to have space above items, well, that's fine. You can add something to row three and have nothing in row one or two if you want to. Uh, so you've got full control. And we've also got things like the dense packing mode that lets us backfill gaps in a tight packed grid. And these are things that you can't do with Flexbox. So we use Flexbox if the content is a row or a column and we don't care about the other one. If you want the size of the items to dictate their layout and you just want to manage the space distribution, those are Flexbox use cases. As soon as you start trying to restrict the flexibility of Flexbox to try and make it two-dimensional, to try and control how the items line up with the things above them, that's probably when you want grid. And if you have use cases where you want to kind of control the layout from the parent, you don't have to worry about the children, or you can't get at the children, then grid is a really good thing to use. So that's why we've got grid. We needed something that worked in this other way. So how do we start to use this in production? Now, the examples I'm going to show you, they're from some things I'm playing around with that I'm probably going to put on my own website. It's for the first time, rather than just building examples, I can start building stuff that I might actually roll out into production. And my personal site is as good a place as any to start. I think we used to all play a lot more on our personal sites. And then we all got, you know, this is where I'm promoting myself on here. I don't want to play around. I'd like to get back to that and actually roll some of this stuff out on my site. So, I'm going to show you some examples. They're actually out of my pattern library. It was great to hear more about pattern libraries in the last talk, because I am a real convert to working pattern library first. Uh, we use Fractal um, to do an awful lot of work uh, for Perch, as well as for websites. So these examples are taken out of my pattern library. And my site is mainly listings of stuff, talks, blog posts, podcasts I've been a guest on, books. It's just a load of listings. And my previous designs got everything in little boxes. So I sort of thought I'd continue this idea on my new site, but have some control over the sizing and spacing of these boxes using grid. So this is an example of a pattern library that brings together a lot of those so I can see how they work together. So identifying some of the different boxes, I found this, this feature block here. And there's actually an image underneath here. I've got a placeholder in and the text lying on top. 
That's a good use case for grid, because it's really good at layering up items. And so here's my markup. So we've got a wrapper. It's got a class of box feature. And then inside, I've got an image. I've got a heading. And I've got the content then underneath. So I'm going to make this a grid. So we turn on grid with display grid. We've got this gap with the grid gap. And then grid template columns, I've said repeat 6 1 FR. That basically gives me six equal width columns. You can use this repeat syntax rather than writing out 1 FR, 1 FR, 1 FR six times. Let's say this FR unit, it defines a fraction of the available space in the grid container. So my six equal width tracks, as the container gets bigger or smaller, they'll always stay equal width. And what this gives me looks like this. And those lines on the grid there are from the Firefox Grid Inspector, which is an excellent tool. If you're playing with grid layout, use Firefox. The Grid Inspector is really, really useful. And so I've turned on something that lets me see the grid and lets you see the grid too, because obviously grid itself doesn't show anything up on your page. But you can see how the items there are sitting one in each of the first three tracks of the grid. Because by default, Grid will start laying things out. The minute the parent becomes a Grid container, the children become Grid items, and they start taking on that behavior. They start laying themselves out on the Grid. Now, that's OK, but that's not what I want in this scenario. I want to position my items. I'm going to do that with this line-based positioning. So we've got Grid column and Grid row, which are actually shorthands for Grid column start, Grid column end, Grid row start, Grid row end. The value before the forward slash is the start line. The value after is the end line. So line 1 to column minus 1. 1 is the left-hand side of the grid. Minus 1 is the far right. Or we could actually use the numbers counting from the left. However, that's because I'm working in English. If I was working in a right-to-left language, line 1 would be on the right-hand side of the grid. So grid respects writing modes. And modern CSS tends to work with writing modes and, and understands that the web is not just English-speaking people and not just left to right languages. So that's kind of important to know that actually the grid would flip if you were in a right to left language. The other thing, I only defined my column tracks there. I didn't define any row tracks. We've got this concept of the explicit grid, which is what you set up with grid template columns, grid template rows. If you place something outside of that grid, or if you are using auto placement and you flow in items and they create more grid tracks to fit, they create more grid tracks in the implicit grid. And so you're going to have the two things. You've got the thing you've defined, and you've got additional tracks to hold extra content. In this case, I've actually got these lines, I've got three tracks, four lines created because I spanned over for uh, three row tracks going to line four. Again, this is the Firefox Grid Inspector showing me that. Uh, really do grab a hold of that and have a look because it makes playing around with grid much easier. So I can then pop my content over that grid. So I'm placing, using line-based positioning, I'm placing the content into the same area that the image is. So I'm overlaying it and Again, with the highlighter on, we get this. And that's a link to the code. All the code for this talk is online, so you can have a look. And you can see how the second auto-generated track there in the layout is growing to accommodate the content. When you create tracks in the implicit grid, they will be auto-sized. They'll grow to contain their content. Uh, you can actually set their size as well. There's a couple of properties, um, grid auto rows and grid auto columns, that will let you define the natural size for the tracks if you want. But with row tracks, you probably just want them to get taller based on whatever you put in. So this shows us we can use grid to layer items. Um, and this works exactly as you'd expect. If things are lower down in the source, they will end up on top. And you can use Z-index, just like with absolute positioning, to change the stack order of the items. Um, so that kind of works really pretty much as you'd expect. So in creating this little box, I've shown you a whole bunch of features of grid layout. We've used those FR units and repeat notation. You've seen how grid can auto-place items if we don't give them an explicit position. We've covered the implicit and explicit grid. We've seen line-based positioning at work. You know that grid respects writing mode. And you've actually used some of the box alignment properties, which you've already seen in Flexbox when we stretched 
our image over the background. We're using box alignment there. That's quite a lot just for a small box. And so that box is going to sit in the listing. Now, the other boxes there are pretty simple. They don't need a lot of grid layout themselves to, to affect their layout. But I'm using a grid layout to create that listing. And I'd like to use that auto placement. I'd like to use that ability of grid just to lay out the items, because then I don't have to worry about how many items I've got on each page. I don't have to worry if they're, they're big or they're small. Grid should just fit them into the layout for me. So we first need to create that layout. And that's pretty simple. We say display grid. And this time, I'm creating a 12-column grid, You're pretty much your standard 12-column flexible grid with 20 pixel gutters between the column and row tracks. And if we look at the finished layout using the grid inspector again, we get this. You can see those flexible tracks. You can see those laid over. And you see how the items are all sitting on the track. Now, that's not going to happen by magic. That's not going to happen by default, because by default, what will happen is this. Because Grid has said, well, you've got all of these items. We've got these 12 tracks. And I'm going to put one item into each track, because that's what it does. It tries to fit things into the grid, one in each track. It'll stick them into skinny columns. So the first thing I want to do is get that title and then the feature box that we've already worked on. I'd like those to be right across the top. So I'm going to position those. So you probably know about those items. You know you've got these things. You want those to appear at the top. So again, we can use that line-based positioning method to position those at the top of the grid. And having done that, we end up with this. So I've positioned my title and my feature box at the top of the grid. And underneath, you can see we've got the rest of my items just laying themselves out um, with the auto placement rules. That's what we'd expect. Now, I don't want to explicitly position those items at the bottom of the grid. I don't know how many I've got. I don't know exactly what shape they're going to be. They're going to just come out of my database. It's going to be the content I've got. What I can do as they come out maybe is add some classes to them. So I can add classes to say whether it's a newer item that I want to be a bit bigger or one of the older ones. And so then I'm going to set up some rules that will work with auto placement with certain types of box. So the items with a class of box newer, I'm going to say grid column auto, so start wherever it was you were going to start with the auto placement rules, but span four. Now, I could do that. That's using the shorthand grid column. Or you could use just the actual property. So for the uh, boxes of the box media, that means they're the ones that have got a, an image above. And so I want those to be a bit taller. So I'm going to span two rows. And I'm just going to say on grid row end, span two. That's all I'm going to say there. So auto is the default, really. You don't need to say auto. But if you want to use grid column and grid row shorthands, you would use auto as the first value. And then my smaller boxes, I think I'll have those to span three, so they'll be a bit, a bit narrower on the grid. And that's all that we need to do. As grid comes across one of those boxes, it's got a class. It knows that it needs to span three or four tracks or two, or two rows if it's a taller box. So this is really nice. You can get this ability to flow items into a grid container. And just by way of the type of item they are, a class on it, or perhaps the, the, the type of component you've got, you can say, oh, well, I'd like you to spam two tracks or three tracks, or behave in a slightly different way. Auto placement is really nice, to, particularly for anything that's coming out of a CMS. Now, those rules were all for my widest breakpoint. Um, I'd obviously like to make my design responsive. And because all of your layout here is defined in the CSS, we're not having to put anything. We're not having to say, oh, this, this item is three rows or two columns or whatever actually there in the CSS, as you do with some of the frameworks that involve just adding classes to define how big things are. It makes it very easy to play around with a responsive layout. Now, you can redefine the grid if you want to in your media queries. You could say, actually, at a narrow breakpoint, I want this um, container to have four tracks rather than 12. You could do that. Or you can just redefine where things sit on the 12-column grid, which is what I've chosen to do. So I'm going to have 12 columns, even if they're very skinny little columns. But I'm just going to change how many tracks things span. So I've got my title spanning right across the grid for very narrow screens. So we've got from line 1 to minus 1 in grid row 1. And then as we get wider, 
I just fiddle around with how that title displays. Or I can redefine how many columns my auto-placed items span. So if the layout's quite narrow, I'll have them span six tracks, so we'll get two, sort of two columns of them, um, and then we go to four with the wider layout. So I've kept that 12-column layout. You can see it there at a narrower view and the wider view. We've just got skinnier tracks, and we take up more of those tracks at a narrower view, which is exactly what you do if you're using something like Bootstrap, uh, except that you're defining it usually in a class or in your, in your SAS or whatever. Um, it's the same kind of idea, though. We span more tracks as we go narrower, and that link will take you to the code. I'll be giving you all of this at the end. So Grid's great fun, and once you get a handle on the different properties, and there is a bunch of new stuff in Grid, once you get sort of the idea of how it's working, it's very, very easy to move things around, and it's great, and you think, yeah, this is a brand new dawn, and then you remember that there are these old browsers. And I saw that I was, I was getting, uh, locking my bike up for a duathlon, turned around and saw this roller trolling me. I can't even get away from the computers to do anything, you know. There it is, but it's, it's going to appear on many slides. So those old browsers aren't going to go away. It's quite likely that a lot of us are going to have 70 or 80% of support for grid layout by the end of the year. If you're building a new project now, you probably can use grid layout, at least for some components. But you're going to have to cope with the old browsers. The nice thing is, that defined in the spec is how Grid works to override all of your old layout methods. This is defined in the spec. So you can use an old layout method and just directly overwrite it with Grid. The old browsers don't know about Grid, so they ignore the Grid. The Grid browsers use the Grid, and, it, and it's defined in the spec that it should override the earlier methods. Because at the CSS Working Group, we know about old CSS. We're keeping it working. We've been keeping it all working for all these years. CSS is absolutely amazing. But the site that I built 20 years ago can still work now. And that's, that's how we do things with CSS. So you don't need to build two layouts. Grid works really, really well as an enhancement. So that's the listing page if we don't have any grid layout at the moment. So everything is displaying in document flow. It's perfectly readable. It's probably not what we want. So all of our boxes are displaying one under the other. So that listing is pretty easy to create a fallback layout for. You could use absolutely anything. In this case, I'm choosing Flex layout, because I know that people who come to my website are essentially web designers. They've probably got Flexbox if they haven't got Grid. So Flex items will become Grid items if Grid is supported. So I can basically just say Display Flex and have some Flex stuff, and then say Display Grid. If the browser doesn't support grid, they're flex items. If it supports grid, they're grid items. Um, and any flex properties on the items will just be ignored. What won't be ignored is anything we needed to add to the flex items in order to get the behavior that we want. For instance, a margin, because we don't have anything like grid gap yet in Flexbox. I think we probably will in a future level of the Flexbox spec. At the moment, you have to use margins for that. So I don't want the margin once I'm in my grid layout. And for this, we have feature queries. Feature queries look like a media query, but instead of checking your screen size or whatever, they report whether the browser says that it supports a CSS property and value. And feature queries have excellent browser support. There are no browsers that support grid layout that do not support feature queries. So you can very safely use a feature query to check if the browser supports grid. And you do it like this. We don't need to remove those flex properties. They're ignored anyway. But what we do want to do is set that margin to 0. So we say, at support, display grid. And then all my listing items just set the margin to 0. So you only need to override things that would conflict with your grid layout once you get into it. So we get this. And the final thing I want to do is just sort out that feature box so it spreads right across the top, even in flex layout. So I give that box a larger flex basis. Again, that's going to be ignored by grid, so we don't need to worry about it. And we get that. Now, it's not quite the same. We've not got that nice overlaying bit. And I could perhaps fake that with absolute positioning if I wanted to. But it's perfectly reasonable. Um, you could go as far as you want to, depending on the sort of browsers that are visiting your site. But what that shows is that, particularly if you're working with components and listings and things that don't have a huge amount of layout involved, 
it's quite easy to use Grid as that enhancement uh, and still get a decent layout for older browsers. A quick rundown of the other properties you might want to override. Float and clear have no effect on a grid item. Inline block, again, they just, those properties just stop applying. There's things that make something like an inline block. As soon as it's a grid item, they stop applying. Display table. If you make something a table cell, it generates anonymous boxes. It generates the table a row, and it d generates a table, and they're all sort of there. Um, if you turn it into a grid item, that happens first. You don't get the box generation, so you don't have anything weird in, in the DOM or whatever for that. So you can use display table cell and then overwrite that as a grid item. That'll just work. If you're using vertical align with um, display table or, or with inline block layout, that's just ignored once it's a grid item. You can use your box alignment properties quite safely. Multi-column layout can work sometimes as a fallback for grid layout. Um, once something is a grid layout, the multi-column properties stop applying. And flex layout, as I say, uh, flex shares the box alignment properties with grid, so that's quite nice. You can use the same alignment and use grid layout. Once things become a grid item, they're no longer a flex item. Your overrides are mostly going to be widths and margins, and anything else you use to sort of tweak that layout. So for instance, here we've got this 33.33% width on the float. Once that item becomes a grid item, it's going to be 33% of the track that it's in, or the area that it's in, which is not what you want. Um, so you need to set that width back to auto. What I'm finding is I have a feature query block, a bunch of selectors, all saying width auto. And that's all I need to do to sort of clear up those widths that are causing a problem. If you're getting weird looking sizing in your grid, check that you're not inheriting some width from a fallback layout. Uh, to make all this a bit easier, I made a cheat sheet that has all of this stuff in it. You can go and, and, and see some worked examples of how to do these fallbacks. And there's also some other resources out there as well. So CSS Grid, it is absolutely here. Um, it's been a very, very quick fly through of some of the things you can be using. There are things that Grid solves that you just can't do with other layout methods, or you can only do in a very fragile way. Um, so I really would say, look at it. Look at it for using it for components. You don't need to make your entire layout a CSS Grid layout, but it might be really nice for tidying up that form or that navigation or that listing, small things that you can just enhance and get to grips with how Grid actually works. As I say, anything you start building today, by the time it lands, you're probably going to be seeing 50, 60, maybe more percent of people with support in their browser. And it's in iOS Safari now. So people with their phones, really useful for lining stuff up in, in small screen layouts. You can start using this. Um, and it's also great fun if you've worked through using all these legacy layout methods for all these years like I have. I've made lots of resources. Um, there's a video tutorial on Grid by example, a whole load of free videos you can get. I created a whole bunch of guides for um, Mozilla for MDN for the launch of Grid into Firefox. There's tons of stuff. You can kind of follow how this spec developed by just looking at the posts on my site as I poked around with Grid Layout over the last four years. So there's a whole ton of stuff there for you. And the actual slides and code examples from this talk are at this URL. And thank you very, very much for listening.